Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, broadcasting to you today from Cardiff in the UK and Wales. And ICMDA brings together uh, over 80 national associations of Christian doctors and dentists around the world, representing over 60,000 healthcare professionals and, and students. And today on ICMDA webinars, we're privileged to have back again, Dr. Rachel Pickering, who'll be coming to us from the Philippines. And she's gonna be speaking on ethical management of torture and ill treatment cases across the world. And I'll introduce her fairly shortly. Well, uh, it's, it's great to have you back, Dr. Rachel Pickering again. And this is for the third of a three part series that Rachel will be bringing us. And uh, this three part series, many of you will have seen the earlier two, but the series is aimed at equipping healthcare professionals to respond to the evils of torture and ill treatment. And the first session where Dr. Rachel looked at definitions, types, the law and God's heart for the persecuted. The second session examined best practice care. That's an acronym care for caring advocating, recording, and evidencing. And this final session, the third one, takes a hands-on approach looking at anonymized real-life cases from different continents with particular consideration of key ethical issues. Dr. Rachel Pickering is a British-trained family medicine specialist, and since 2007, she has majored on offender healthcare. When in the UK, she locums within English prisons, and she's the co-founder of Integritas Healthcare, which is a faith-inspired NGO with a heart for detainees. Heart, again, there's another acronym for you, heart delivering healthcare expertise, advocacy, research, and training for and about detainees. The pandemic gave Integritas the opportunity to branch out into telemedicine as well. But in the non-virtual world, the real world, Rachel spends about a quarter of her life working behind bars. That's real metal bars in the Philippines and other low middle income countries. Rachel's married to fellow prison doctor Mark Pickering, who many of you will know as the CEO of the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK, which is one of ICMDA's biggest national member bodies. And for Mark and Rachel, their greatest joy is their young adult daughter, Zoe, who spent most of her teenage years hopping in and out of Asian jails. I might add, not as an offender, but uh, to, to help people and, and helping her mum and dad particularly. And uh, Zoe became the, the best healthcare assistant a prison doc could wish for. So, so there we are, Rachel, it's just a real pleasure to have you back again. And we really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay. So it's lovely to be back. Um, as Peter said, this is the last of a three part webinar series, and the other two parts are already available on YouTube. I'm going to be talking about the ethical issues uh, of torture and ill treatment cases around the world. And just giving a bit of an introduction first about our subject. And then also I'm going to be giving a one page overview of the ethical issues that will be coming up in some of the cases. Then we'll be looking at some cases from particular ICMDA regions because ICMDA splits its uh, work up into 14 geographical regions. I deliberately haven't specified a country within those and I, I will not be specifying which countries that they are from, but the regions I have. Yeah. Just because I talk about a case happening in a region doesn't mean they doesn't happen in other regions of the world. It's just ones that I have come across. Then we'll be summarizing, uh, giving a few biblical thoughts, and then moving on to a Q&A. And I really look forward to tackling some meaty questions, so please put them in the chat. So as Peter said, I'm a British doctor, I'm a member of CMF, and uh, my uh, special interest, I suppose, but not by design, it's just a, a necessary tool I've had to pick up, is the detection and prevention of torture and ill treatment, which you often see abbreviated as TAIT. Um, at the moment, I am in the Philippines. It's late in the evening here, but I look forward to staying awake and giving you this uh, talk. 
So as Peter said, we have five services spelling the, the English word heart. Uh, here you can see um, me doing some minor surgery actually on a, a prisoner, removing some staples that had been left into his amputation stump. He'd been amp it was amputated because he'd been shot in the leg multiple times as part of his interrogation. Um, and then immediately after amputation in uh, the hospital, he'd been transferred to prison. There aren't any healthcare facilities. So the staple stayed in for months and months and months and got overgrown. Uh, you can also see here uh, our Philippines manager, Ma'am Loy, uh, handing out package, packages of food to police detainees during the height of the pandemic. So healthcare sometimes can consist of food, just simple food. We do a lot of torture and ill treatment work. Uh, this is a surgical scar from a man who had had his humerus cracked from a flying kick to his arm whilst he was being interrogated. And you can also see here some, a body map where I've drawn the neurological and dermatological findings of somebody who'd had prolonged handcuffing. Um, we do a lot of advocacy work. Um, Peter mentioned my daughter Zoe. Uh, there you see Zoe talking on the radio about the need for provision for autistic people. Um, she herself is autistic. And you'll also see some surgical staples in some self-harm wounds, and that will feature in one of the cases I discuss. We do a lot of research work. You can see here three volunteers on their way to a jungle prison to assess the health needs there. And you can also see at the bottom three medical students doing research into the concepts of mental health within um, Western Pacific jails. And then finally, we train. We do quite a bit of training. We've got a medical student there doing a moulage, teaching uh, people who care for prisoners' children how to care for somebody who's unconscious. And then there's another medical student taking a history of somebody who has TB in a jail that's run by a gang. Okay. Peter's done most of the relevant housekeeping, but just to say some of the content in this subject is distressing. If you are upset, please do switch the video off um, or just disconnect and join later. Please contact us as well. Uh, we're very used to giving emotional first aid and signposting to formal help. And our contact details, you can get them via ICMDA also at the end of this presentation. So just one slide, I don't believe in lots of ethics slides. Some of the ethical issues that come up when you're looking after victims or just complainants of torture and ill treatment are the, the, the old chestnuts of person's autonomy versus society's need for justice. Um, what should come first? And that's especially uh, happens when you're thinking about capital punishment execution. Beneficence, doing good, and definitely not doing harm as a healthcare professional. Forensic neuropsychology or the biology of blame, you know, can genetics, brain injury, that kind of thing be responsible for uh, criminal behavior? And if so, should the person be held liable or excused? The concept of whether torture can actually ever be a good thing, a moral good, um, a utilitarian would say that it depends how many people are going to be tortured versus how many people are going to be helped. Whereas Kant, Kantians, people who follow Kant's teaching, would say that, you know, you cannot use somebody um, to achieve an end, that you can't mistreat somebody just to achieve a good in the end. Torturing for information, even if that information is correct, is not ever appropriate. Whereas a utilitarian would say, well, to torture one person in order to get information that's going to help two people, well, that's okay. And it's a numbers game. Culture, especially religious culture, um, can often influence whether or not torture and ill treatment is accepted, even if it's illegal. Morality versus legality, whether something's morally right or wrong, even if it might at a push reading of the international humanitarian law, be legal. Equivalence of care, how a doctor, nurse, or other healthcare professional treats somebody who they know is being abused or suspect is being abused 
compared with how they would treat somebody else who wasn't, or has somebody else who was um, a free person who wasn't even in prison to start with. <clears throat> Clinical involvement, unfortunately, either indirectly, turning a blind eye, just patching up a wound and then sending somebody back to the cell knowing they're going to be hurt again or directly being clinically involved in torture and ill-treatment is something that far too many healthcare professionals have on their conscience. And sadly, some of them don't even have it on their conscience because they've never been taught that it's wrong. Mandatory reporting of torture is um, something that is particularly a hot topic within Europe, that even if a patient says, doctor, please don't say anything, I'll just get beaten up again in retaliation for telling you about it. Please don't tell the authorities that somebody's tortured me. Um, that actually we should be doing it in order to safeguard the many people from the wrongdoing of a few bad apples in countries where torture is actually illegal. And then informed consent, whether healthcare professionals are doing torturous things to patients, which they shouldn't be doing anyway, or if they are just misusing information that they've acquired and not had informed consent to use in a certain way. That is another issue that comes up, especially when you come across information in a manner you didn't expect to, and then you're trying to decide what to do with it. Okay, there's probably many more, but those are the ones that came to my mind, the top 10, if you like. As I said, we're going to be looking at a few uh, cases from different ICMDA regions. And if you're not familiar with them, here is a coloured map showing you where they are. So firstly, white torture in South America. What are we talking about here? not talking about the torture of a Caucasian person like myself. We're talking about the concept of sensory deprivation, removing all colour, all sound, um, comfortable temperatures, human contact, removing everything that makes life colourful and bearable. Not actually physically hurting somebody, although having a very cold room can be, can be painful but just removing everything that makes your brain interested. And when that goes on for hours, days, weeks, months, years, it um, is torturous. And again, if you look at the ethical issues, in some countries that actually would be legal because the UN definition, as we discussed in part one, talks about actual pain and suffering? How do we define suffering? This is a form of psychological and environmental torture, not physical torture. Equivalence of care often comes into it because in many countries, uh, doctors, uh, in especially sometimes nurses as well, have to go to solitary confinement blocks where these suites tend to be. Um, and they're meant to check on people. Well, if you know that somebody's having prolonged solitary confinement and sensory deprivation like this, then you should be uh, protesting about it. And, you know, clinical involvement. If you are asked to assess somebody because they've started shouting out about things that they're seeing, they're hallucinating, which does happen when you're deprived of other stimuli for a long time. Uh, and you don't raise the alarm, then you are, you know, actually treating somebody who's actively being tortured. There's some further reading, which will be available in hyperlinks when the slides go around. Uh, the British Psychological Society has got a very interesting paper on this. And then there's actually a book that's been written as a companion to a film, which was recently uh, showcased at a film festival. And that was from somebody who's experienced this kind of uh, torture and ill treatment, um, and it's simply called White Torture. Interestingly, that book, as uh, author, was not ill-treated in South America. It was another region of the world, but I'm not going to say which. Um, case B, um, Mr. B was executed in Europe. Did you know that execution is still legal in at least one country in Europe? It used to be one. It may become more, um, uh, Eurasia perhaps. I won't say any more than that. 
And I'm actually not going to say anything more about this case at all at the moment. We're going to come back to Mr. B at the end. But start thinking, which country in Europe still executes people? Might not be where Mr. B met his end. Case C, Mr. C uh, suffered a lethal injection in North America. And I'm actually going to spend a little bit more time on Mr. C. He was a previously law-abiding part-time pastor. In 1972, whilst earning money in order to fund his part-time pastoring and other uh, family activities, he suffered a frontal brain injury when a saw from a sawmill um, malfunctioned. And as you'll see in a minute, he suffered extensive frontal lobe damage, which had to have surgery. And from then on, it's documented that he had a big change in personality and massive difficulties with impulse and anger control. 20 odd years later, uh, his whole life's dissolved. His relationships have gone. He's become an alcoholic. He shot a police officer who was responding to a domestic argument that Mr. C was having with his girlfriend. And as a result of that, uh, nearly 20 years later, and he was the longest serving death row prisoner. So subject for a long sol solitary confinement, longest death row prisoner in Missouri, USA. Age 74, he was executed by lethal injection. And back in 2015, there was already beginning to be the problem of finding the right uh, cocktail of uh, lethal injection drugs that USA penitentiaries were used to using. I don't know whether that was a problem in his case, but they were having to be more creative in their use of execution drugs. And some of those combinations are less humane than others, if indeed you could say that any form of lethal injection is humane. Here you can see his uh, brain uh, missing a good chunk of its frontal lobe. And this is publicly available if you just search for him on the internet, you can see this picture. This is Mr. C at the time of his arrest. And so what are the ethical issues here? Well, the death penalty was passed by the judge. And that is largely driven by the rights of the individual versus the society's, especially victims, relatives need for justice. There's also the concept of deterrent, whether or not that is something that helps uh, justice for society and autonomy for potential future victims not to be killed. The biology of blame is the real biggie here. Uh, this gentleman uh, undoubtedly has massive neuropsychological issues and they were involved in a forensic incident. So forensic neuropsychology is a really uh, emerging and exciting front within psychology. And I think it was questionable, my personal opinion, as to whether or not Mr. C should have been found guilty because he may or may not have actually been responsible. Or even if he was guilty, depending on what the actual uh, offence he was charged with, what should have been the sentence? Should he have gone to um, a forensic mental health unit? Should he have just been imprisoned? Should he really have been executed? You can actually read some of the appeals online. It's very, very interesting reading. I was never involved in this case, but it's a case that I have read a lot about uh, in my criminal justice learning. Another issue is the supportive culture. Um, America as a whole society has been overwhelmingly, the USA predominantly pro the death penalty, although it often goes along political party lines. And there is, the pendulum is beginning to swing. Some states are now beginning to outlaw it. Because it's legal, a legal form of punishment, capital punishment, falls outside of the United Nations definition of torture. So it comes down to morality versus legality. It is legal, but is it moral? Is it right to kill somebody with a brain injury, with low intelligence, who was like that before they did their crime? There's equivalence of care for all those years that he was on death row. 
Um, we know that a lot of prisoners on American death rows do not get the equivalence of care compared with non-solitary, non-death row prisoners, and certainly compared with those outside of prison. In many, many states in America, healthcare professionals, registered healthcare professionals are involved in the process of capital punishment. And that is something that the American Physicians Association and also the World Medical Association condemns. Not doing harm, putting a needle into somebody and injecting drugs that will cause their death is harmful. And we as physicians and other healthcare professionals are meant to not harm. And he doesn't consent to this. You know, he doesn't consent to be killed. It's really rare that a prisoner does. He definitely didn't. Uh, a couple of interesting papers for you to read are from the British Psychological Association about this biology of blame and also a very interesting balanced analysis of Mr. C's case in the Washington Post. Then Mr. D, um, mock execution in Eurasia. Mock execution would form, fall under the definition of psychological torture and psychological torture is quite hard to prove as being torture under the United Nations definition because of needing to cause severe pain and suffering. So it really comes down to morality versus legality. And um, the further reading may give you a clue, if the drawing doesn't, that this is actually a historical case of something that happened to a well-known author many years ago. The author wrote House of the Dead, which is a semi-autobiographical description of what happened to him after he had suffered this mock execution when he was sent to a, a, a prison camp. And then for those of you who really like to look into things in detail, there's a book called Psychological Torture, uh, which is very well worth reading, but it's, it's not cheap. And of course, this happened uh, in Russia many, many years ago because the author is Mr. D, is Mr. Dostoevsky. Okay, on to Mr. E, who suffered medical torture in Europe. And this person was a man I saw when doing some expert witness work. I found him in a solitary confinement uh, block of a European country's prison. And he had a lot of self-harm scars, many of which were very old. You can see there's white scars on his chest. He also had an awful lot of very recent uh, wounds uh, that he had inflicted on himself because he was so distressed at being uh, detained. He was taken to hospital. And so it wasn't the prison staff who did this, but the hospital staff. The hospital medical staff, he alleges, put surgical staples in him all over his body without any anaesthetic, local or general, nor entonox or anything. That is what he alleges. I couldn't prove it. I couldn't investigate it because it wasn't something that happened in the prison. It happened in the hospital and I couldn't get the hospital notes. But when he got back to the prison, he's been seen many, many times since then by the prison healthcare professionals who visit solitary confinement. They knew about this. And so the following issues arise. Within the medical culture, that must have been acceptable to the doctors and nurses in the emergency room he was sent to to do that. They must have thought, oh, he's a prisoner. He's always self-harming. You know, this will teach him. If that's what they did, then that would have been the cultural thinking going on the group think. Certainly isn't equivalence of care with what you and I would expect if we were to injure ourselves either accidentally or deliberately. It's clinical involvement in torture. In fact, more than that, it's medical torture. You're inflicting severe pain. You, I don't know if you've ever accidentally put uh, even an office staple into your hand. I accidentally shot myself uh, in my hand when I was stapling a patient's wound once, and it really hurt. Imagine having that done 90, 100 times when you're very psychologically distressed anyway. It's doing harm, causing such harm when you know such pain, when you know you could just give a local anaesthetic sedation or even for that many wounds, 
general anaesthetic and, and take them to theatre and do it under general anaesthetic. That's a maleficent thing to do. He certainly didn't consent to it. He says that uh, they, he was held down while it happened. I don't know if this is true, but if it was true, then that's certainly not informed consent. That's against his, his wishes. Very occasionally, I've had a patient who says, doctor, I know you haven't got any anaesthetic with you, but I really want this out. Please just remove this without anaesthetic. That would be with their informed consent. This is completely without consent. And then in Europe, the um, Council of Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights, says that you have the right not to be tortured and ill-treated. And the Council of Europe body that monitors compliance with Article 3, the Committee for Prevention of Torture and Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment, or CPT for short, have got policies and sort of suggestions uh, that they have honed over the years. And one of those is that even if a patient says, doctor, um, I, I know you're a really nice doctor and you didn't do this to me or nurse, but please don't tell the authorities that that guard or that other nurse at the hospital did this to me. Because if you do, um, word will only get back to their friends or even them. You know, they're on duty again tomorrow night and they might beat me in retaliation. Nothing will change. They won't get sacked for this. Please don't report this torture. So in countries where torture and ill treatment is illegal, i.e. all Council of Europe countries, which are the EU countries plus quite a few others, including the country we're talking about here, this treatment of this man is illegal. But if he says, please, please don't go and talk to the National Preventative Me uh, Mechanism, NPM, which is the body that is meant to have these things investigated and stopped. Really, under the CPT regulations, we should be reporting it, even though the patient is asking us not to disclose. And the, the thinking with behind that goes, for the good of the many, to root out these few bad apples in countries where the state has forbidden torture and ill treatment. This is what we should do, even if it means going against the tortured individual's wishes. Personally, I have some reservations about that. But I can see that within countries that have effective mechanisms, effective NPMs, that is actually possibly okay, that for the greater good to root out these few bad apples, I can see the sense in that. But I've also seen it go wrong many times in lower and middle income countries or countries where even though it's an economically rich country, it's really not that bothered about justice for the individual. When you report things, sometimes nothing changes and the person who's the origin of the uh, you know, need to report the patient gets harmed all over again. Now, I don't know what happened to Mr. E. Uh, I don't know if he genuinely was tortured or if he was just saying that, medically tortured. But that's quite a classic case of clinicians allegedly behaving with maleficent, maleficence. Then moving on to Mr. F., um, who suffered falaka in South Asia. Falaka is uh, when people's feet are tied and the soles of their feet are beaten. It's quite a popular torture in many parts of the world because it is very, very painful, but often leaves very little physical evidence and is very hard to prove uh, months and years later. Uh, this is a man that I did an expert witness case for. The picture isn't him. It's just a picture I got copyright free off the internet. The main issues here in his particular case is that the culture supports it. Even though it is illegal, the criminal justice uh, investigative culture supports it, and many people in society also support it. And then there's clinical involvement indirectly, because this gentleman gave an account to me that the day after this had happened to him, he was seen by a doctor 
in an emergency room about something else and that they could clearly see that he had been badly injured in many ways. And yet what they wrote in the medical notes did not um, elude what had happened. It was just, okay, so you've got some injuries. Let's just make you feel a bit better. And then back you go. It was indirect clinical involvement um, and facilitation because you're permitting somebody to be sent back. And further reading, if you're interested, is the American Journal of Medicine. Um, there's a very interesting uh, talk uh, about Falaka in there. And then Physicians for Human Rights have got quite a lot to say about clinical involvement in torture. And then moving towards the end of our case studies, Mr. G. Mr. G was a gentleman I saw who'd had forced solar gazing or FSG, basically being forced to look at the uh, midday sun in Francophone Africa. And there are two ways of doing that. You can either uh, take a prisoner outside and tell them, look up in the sun for 20 minutes. And if they close their eyes or look away, then they're beaten. They're forced to you know, continue looking at the sun every time they put their gaze down or shut their eyes, they're beaten. The other way to do it is to use some kind of ophthalmic instrument or tape and uh, tape up in your eyelids. And there was clinical involvement in this because the gentleman told me that after a few days of this happening every day, his eyelids became so swollen and the front of his eyes uh, were so uh, damaged that um, it was quite, you know, he, his whole eyes were such a mess. And so a doctor was uh, produced, appeared in his cell and gave him some drops and just disappeared again. So the doctor didn't do the torturing, but then it continued again. And there is an interesting series of case studies by an ophthalmologist in Nature where this is discussed and the retinal and other damage findings months and years later on, and also psychological trauma. And you can read about that in Nature. And then there's also uh, a link here from the World Medical Association's Declaration of Tokyo, um, which prohibits medical involvement in torture. And then lastly, forced virginity testing of Miss H in the Middle East and North Africa. Many countries do this, and it's usually done by a doctor, um, often even a male doctor, which can be even more horrific for ladies. Um, it has no value whatsoever. What does it matter if a woman's a virgin or not when she's in custody? But it's often a humiliating experience that people uh, go through. It's often supported by patriarchal cultures and religious cultures. Um, again, it because it's not causing extreme physical pain, although it can be painful, uh, physically painful. It's a morality versus legality issue. Um, it's clinical involvement, direct clinical. It's medical torture another form of medical torture. It has no beneficence and I would say it's harmful. So there is the issue of maleficence and these ladies don't consent to it. So it's informed consent. And there are two very interesting um, articles about that from Human Rights Watch and the World Health Organization. So just in summary, there are lots of ethical issues going on here. Um, there's top 10 are there. The methods that we've talked about, there are hundreds of methods of torture, and many of them historically have got regional origin. Um, but over the years, especially in our global society with planes and the ability to travel around the world easily and the internet, most methods are now widespread, although there are still favorite methods in certain countries. And even if there is a method that's particularly localized still, a niche method, the victims afterwards may flee globally and, and seek asylum elsewhere. So in closing, in responding to the issue of torture and ill treatment, we need to do three things. When I'm teaching people how to give evidence in court, less experienced clinicians who are first time in court, I say there are three things you need to do. You need to stand up, speak up, and then sit down and shut up. Okay. So we need to stand up as Christians. Micah 6, 8 says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to stand up and act. 
and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6 8. Stand up and do something if it's safe to do so. We need to speak up. Sometimes, rather than doing things, we have to speak or write. And Proverbs 31, 8 and 9 starts as follows. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. So even if you're not a torture expert or a doctor or other healthcare professional working with torture complainants and victims, you can get involved in lobbying physicians for human rights, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, those kind of things. Okay, You can speak to colleagues about it. And finally, sometimes it's right to shut up and pray. Sometimes I do not speak up because it's not safe for the patient and it's not safe for me or my colleagues. But even if we aren't speaking, we aren't standing, we're not doing something, we can shut up and pray. And the Bible says we should pray without ceasing. My favorite verse about involvement um, with people who are tortured and ill-treated and suffering in prison is Hebrews 13.3. Continue to remember those in prison as if you as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated, ill-treated, tortured, as if you yourselves were suffering, being ill-treated, being tortured. And then finally, if in doubt, remember the case of Mr. B? He had some advice for us because that too is a historical case. Mr. B, as I said earlier, was executed in Europe, but I didn't say which country. And we talked about the fact that today there is still one country in the world, Belarus, where execution is legal. Uh, it's done by shooting in the head there, I believe. But actually, Mr. B wasn't in Belarus and he wasn't shot. He was hanged in Germany on the 9th of April, 1945 which is 78 years ago, this coming Easter Sunday, when we celebrate the fact that our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, was barbarously tortured and executed on Good Friday. But because he was God, he rose again. Jesus died a torturous death so that we didn't have to for our sins. And Mr. B, uh, of course, was Patrick Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said this when giving a sermon on 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Christianity stands or falls with its revolutionary protest against violence, arbitrariness, and pride of power, and with its plea for the weak. And I thought that was a fitting quote to end this series with. Thank you. It's been lovely speaking to you on this series. We're going to go to questions now. Also happy to take questions by email later. We have a website, integritashealthcare.org. Our website address is email address is office at integritashealthcare.org. And I really look forward to talking with you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been listening to Dr. Rachel Pickering uh, and the third of the series on, on torture and uh, some amazing cases that we've heard about here from all over the world. And, and sobering too, isn't it, that as Dr. Rachel says, they're becoming more widely spread now because of increased communication between countries. We've got quite a few questions coming in, Rachel. So first of all, from Rod McRory, who's saying, do you find working remotely online throws up more ethical issues? For example, the limited ability to provide emotional support or working in different legal jurisdictions. And you've had, of course, a lot of experience before COVID and then two years of during COVID when, when you develop your telemedicine services. Your thoughts? Working remotely, um, whether or not you're just looking at documents and photographs that have been emailed to you or whether or not you're working over telemedicine, is, I think, often more challenging. And I'm not sure with, from that question if it was talking about emotional support for me um, as, as the doctor or healthcare professional doing this 
or for my colleagues who are perhaps on the other end of the camera, or if you're talking about uh, support for the patient, being able to empathize, hold the patient's hand and say, it's okay, touch their knee perhaps and say, you know, okay, you can take a break. I didn't find it more difficult for myself um, because when I work over the internet, I'm usually at home and I've got my family and I can get on the phone to my friends and things like that and we can take a break. And, and actually, if it's all too much, you can you haven't got the patient in front of you there and then you can, if you're not actually in the telemedicine thing, you can just switch off your camera and have a cry for a minute or something like that. Um, so for myself, I didn't find it more emotionally distressing. I found it more uh, frustrating in many ways. It's also more risky because you don't know for sure who's off screen. If you're doing it in a secure environment and you, you can see the patient in front of you, they might tell you that nobody else is in the room, but you don't know that for sure. You don't know that there's nobody tapping in on the line on their end, um, that kind of thing. So there's a lot more risks um, security-wise, patient safety-wise, as well as I, I think it is more difficult for the patient. I've had several patients find it more difficult to talk about over the screen because it doesn't seem they're just talking to yet another camera. You know, you're not really there. And for me, a big part of the process of, of gaining somebody's trust whether I'm seeing them professionally because I am being their treating doctor or as an expert is that you need to gain trust and trust is much harder to develop over um, a Zoom call, especially in countries where the bandwidth is very poor or there's poor electricity because you're having to switch at least your video camera off. So you're just a voice often. Good question. Thank you. A question here from someone you might know, actually, Mark Pickering, who was asking, um, uh, well, he was prompted to ask this question, Dr. Rachel, but um, do, you, do you find it harder to address issues of ill treatment in a high income country or in a low or middle income country when you come across it? Okay. I think Just that's a question I'm... coming from ex real experience. So anyway, uh, enlighten us. Um, Mark is my husband and a fellow prison GP who has worked out um, uh, with Integritas, uh, not as much as me, but mainly works in, in prisons and forensic uh, psychiatry hospitals in the UK and is very experienced in that work. I have remembered talking on occasion with Mark, and we do talk shop at home, about when we've seen a case of ill treatment in British secure environments. And it is really harrowing. I believe it is safe to disclose to the authorities those things, even if the patient doesn't want to. And I think in general, Britain, for example, will try and deal with people who commit um, offences whilst in positions of power within our secure environments. I'm dealing with a case at the moment I was asked to investigate where um, a patient was uh, allegedly beaten by four prison officers in a high-income country. Um, and you can see quite a lot of CCTV evidence, but you can't actually see what happens in the cell, but you can see before and after, and there are witness statements. And I found it really, really harrowing because I was furious that this is happening. And it's happening more, I think, during the pandemic, I think uh, quite a few fuses have flipped and people have got sh more short-tempered. I'm seeing more over-enthusiastic restraint, more ill-treatment of people. And now we're seeing frank assault cases, um, even within the UK. Not often, but sometimes. Within other high-income countries, uh, for example, that um, man who was stapled um, with the self-harm injuries, that's a high-income European country. And I was, I don't think it's wrong to be angry. Jesus got angry. You know, he overturned the tables and the temple. It's not wrong to be angry, but you have to be careful how you act in your anger. And you need to be very careful. You don't sort of blurt out something inappropriate there and then. Uh, you need to control yourself, go and think about how you respond. 
in low and middle income countries, I get less angry, often more frustrated because actually resolving these issues, whether for the individual or societies, are much harder, longer term thing. But I find it more understandable that it happens in these other countries. Thank you. Uh, another colleague here is is asking this this whole question uh, around uh, the biology of blame, uh, if you like. So, uh, and your striking story, I think, it was uh, case C, wasn't it, of the man with the with half of his frontal lobe missing, uh, who was uh, who underwent capital punishment many many years after a uh, a shooting police officer. So Laura uh, is saying, thanks, Rachel, this is so helpful. Do you have any further comments on the biology of blame for criminal behaviour and considerations around ability to consent for other things for persons with brain injury or cognitive challenges? And, and the follow-up, um, can, can medical consent assessments be used as part of advocacy, you know, taking, taking uh, the case to those about the patient not being in a position to be culpable because of their brain injury or, or psychopathological state? I can answer that question as a general practitioner, family medicine specialist who has a special interest in mental health. Um, I've done an awful lot of assessments under the Mental Health Act. I hold what's called Section 12 approval within the UK um, to detain people under our Mental Health Act. and. I can't, however, answer as a psychiatrist, let alone a forensic psychiatrist or a, a forensic psychologist. This is a massive area. You know, forensic psychiatry, forensic neuropsychology is so vast and complicated. I'm sure there are many people better qualified than me to, to answer. But just using common sense, which is what we're talking about, you know, informed consent. If somebody isn't able to understand, you know, I'm, I'm seeing them in a, in a prison cell, you know, five years after they shot somebody and they've been sentenced to life. If they can't understand and give informed consent for something simple like um, whether or not they want to have this tumour removed, you know, uh, they can't understand that it's nasty. Uh, they, they just say, oh, yeah, well, I've got a big lump on my skin. Actually, that's a tumour. Oh, so I'm going to refer you to the uh, dermatologist urgently to have it removed. Uh, okay, do you understand what needs to happen? If somebody doesn't have the mental capacity to give informed consent for something like that, and I am therefore referring them under a best interest principle, or I am, say, giving them antibiotics, even though they don't understand what antibiotics are for a chest infection, and I'm doing it with their best interests at heart, then you have to wonder whether or not they can actually understand the complex issues of what's right and wrong on difficult moral issues, such as, well, he hit me, so I hit him back. I hit him harder. Oops, accidentally he died. You know, these things are really complicated, but common sense dictates that if you can't consent for something simple, um, then, you know, you can't understand more complicated, more nuanced things. And then moving on to the biology of blame as a whole, I have immense sympathy for so many prisoners. When I work in the UK, you know, more than a quarter of the men I see um, during a general prison medicine clinic, I would say have a mild uh, learning uh, difficulty. And many of them are, are, have IQs significantly under 70. They have traumatic brain injuries. An awful lot of prisoners have traumatic brain injuries. And I hate to think what would have happened. I've had a brain injury. I was knocked out and my broker's areas is damaged. If it had been my frontal lobe, perhaps I'd be in prison for doing some nasty thing in anger. But thankfully it wasn't. It was my broker's area, my speech center. Yeah. I don't know if that helps, but they're musings on the subject of. Okay. Yeah, there's a there's a big element of there, but for the grace of God, isn't isn't there? I think absolutely, quite, yeah. and that's something um, I often say to prisoners. You know, if I'd had your upbringing, if I'd had, I sometimes think in my head, I don't say this, your genetic heritage. If I'd had your parents' economic circumstances, your poor education, then I may well be sitting in the prison cell next to you. 
Now, so often, you know, our upbringing determines our, our future. Yeah, and and of course, it goes right to the heart of Christian morality, doesn't it? With your with your final verse, Hebrews thirteen three, about um, you know treating them as if we ourselves were in that situation, you know, do it, doing to others as we'd want done to us. Uh, there's so an interesting just, uh, Bonhoeffer if I could just put in here yeah, as well. Yeah, um, Bonhoeffer is attributed to have said, you know, we must learn to regard others less in the light of what they do or don't do and more in the light of what they have suffered. Suffered in upbringing, suffered with genetic heritage, suffered through injury. You know, then that's the philosophy I go in with. Okay. Yeah. Now, of course, the flip side is that, um, you know, some people uh, have done terrible things and, and there may not be mitigating circumstances. This anonymous question here who's saying, Rachel, thanks for another compassionate, sobering and thought provoking presentation. I just wanted to ask how you personally are able to show Christian kindness and compassion to the perpetrators of torture and ill treatment without demonizing them. Uh, as the press and society generally do, mindful that many abusers have been abused themselves and have hurt people, hurt people. Uh, could you could you just say a little bit about your um, your approach to the abusers as opposed to the abused, and and how you can function in that in that situation where you're seeing some horrendous things that have been done uh, to others. Well, thankfully, I rarely see the person who's inflicted the damage. I often see the damage afterwards, and it's often hard to prove exactly which person did it. And it's rarely a good idea, even if you know to go direct to them, you need to go over their heads and go to their boss or relevant authorities. On occasion, I have um, given evidence in court against somebody um, who is, you know, saying this person did this horrible thing to this person and I can see them in the in the dock when they have been uh, you know caught and, and are being prosecuted and that's quite satisfying I don't I'm not a believer in the abolition of punishment I think there is a place for punishment I think it might be easier to answer the question though in terms of I see an awful lot of men in prison who haven't been tortured themselves necessarily um, but who have done horrific things like the most awful, sadistic child abuse, sexual child abuse that they've done to children. And one case particularly comes to mind. I was working in one of Britain's high secure prisons many years ago, and I had a man who was trying to gnaw one of his hands off. He was trying to bite through his extensor tendons. And no matter what I did, he managed to somehow get the dressing off and have another go at it. And I asked him why he was doing it one day. And he said, it's because this is the hand that's responsible for it all. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when I was a boy myself, my father took this hand and put it on his penis and made me masturbate him. And that's, you know, when I was first abused and it became normal. And it's the only way I know how to show love is through paedophilia. I don't feel any attraction for adults or, or you know, I, I'm only attracted to children. Uh, and, and and so I, I was just wanting to punish this hand for starting it all off. And I cried when I got out of that cell. Um, he's died now. That was very sobering. I rarely feel um, anger towards people who've done horrific things because usually, unless you are a really rare psychopath who's you know had a perfect upbringing and, I, and I've never met one usually there's an explanation for why people do what they do and even if they are the most heinous villain you know God still loves us we've all sinned and in God's book all sins are our are, are sin so who are we to judge as, as Jesus said you know let him who's without sin cast the first stone I'm not there to judge. That's a judge's job. I'm a doctor. Uh, thank you. And uh, we've got more questions, but we have virtually run out of time now. I did, just wonder if I could ask you one more question. And that's with, with regard to advocacy, because, you know, a, a lot of what we're trying to do here is really to change policy, change laws, change people's behavior who are in positions of power. 
and uh, use it to abuse. Can you, just from your own experience, can you tell us about what you know? What what forms of advocacy do you think have been most effective in this area in actually curbing, you no know, wrong behaviour? And, and and perhaps you can tell us a story or two just to uh, close that. Um, okay. Um, there are three forms of advocacy that I. Um, think of under broad brushstrokes. One is individual advocacy, you know, writing a letter about a particular patient, a report, going to speak to the prison governor about a particular patient. The second is to advocate for a group of people, as in, you know, why is this prison so full of men with Down syndrome? You know, or why are there so many men here who've got, um, you know, fragile X syndrome? Um, and then the third is to um, do general awareness raising advocacy. So we try and do a, I certainly did until recently, and we're going to be starting up again. If anyone wants to look at my website tomorrow, every Friday, we've tried to do a awareness raising blog on our news uh, page of our website, commenting often with a hook into a particular case. And then getting that message out into social media. As to what's most effective, it really depends on the country and the personality of the person you're dealing with and the risks of the society that are all around you. Uh, I can remember one case, which perhaps I'll just give, uh, give one case. There was a, a man in a Western Pacific jail who we were doing a big in reach clinic. And I was aware throughout the afternoon that we saw hundreds of people that were brought to us prisoners. But there was this one man behind these little green um, bars who um, was not brought out. And I, I was the doctor in charge of the clinic, so I wasn't busy seeing people. I was more sort of floating and helping. So I meandered over and I thought, well, why is this man in this tiny little cell all, all on his own? And uh, I was told I had to step away from him. Um, I wasn't allowed to talk to him. He is being punished. Said, well, why is he being punished? Um, as in punished more than just coming to prison. I said, he's been punished by solitary confinement. I said, well, why is that? Because he has TB. She, I said, do you mean he's been isolated because you're worried that he has TB? He said, no, he's been punished because he has TB. Oh, yes, and because he's mentally ill. Turned out. He had, did have TB. He was um, actually not mentally ill in our understanding of the word. He had a learning disability and he liked to just call out a little bit. But he was perfectly amiable. He wasn't violent. He wasn't psychotic or behaving in any kind of disruptive way. But because he was sort of not, you know, behaving like most other people, he stood out. And so he was punished for that. He was being underfed. And this cell was not large enough to stand up in, even for him, a short man. And so when I insisted that we would pack up the clinic and go, if I wasn't allowed to see him, they let him out. And he couldn't walk without his knees being bent because he had developed contractures from squatting on this little plank for so long. And the plank, the reason he was squatting on a plank was that actually his cell was over an open sewer where the sewage from the prison, other prison cells was, was flowing through on the way out to the to the main sewer. And so it was really smelly for him as well. He hadn't been outside. He had vitamin D deficiency. He was really, really unwell. But when I went and talked to the warden of the prison, I said, look, people who are like this are better in company. He's not actually got a productive cough, so he doesn't need to be kept separate from his TV point of view. I said, look how happy he is now and how less troublesome he is and I wrote a letter and I said when I come back in three months time when we do our next clinic I really really hope that I will find that he has been treated in accordance with the convention against torture and that he is being treated in the same way as the other prisoners I didn't know what would happen but when I came back three months later he was in the main cell he was not there and I think that was a small win. So 
that's just one case that springs to mind. Yeah, great, great story. And it just also underlines the importance that the influence that a Christian doctor can have going into that situation, just, just graciously making a, a, a learned assessment and then making gentle suggestions to people uh, to improve the lot of, in this case, one prisoner, but maybe changing the, the guards as well. So thank you so much, Rachel, for your example, for your work and all that you're doing. I've just uh, one comment here in the in the chat I'll read out from from uh, Dr. Stamp, who is saying, especially at this time of the church year, it's a great comfort to me that even if we by grace are unlikely to experience torture ourselves, we can take the injustice of torture and our upset and pain about it to our Saviour, who, as Rachel said, himself suffered torture and ill treatment. He knows the human condition and the worst of our experiences and desolation. So thanks very much, uh, Rachel. Thanks to all of you for coming along today. So uh, God bless you all, and we look forward to seeing you soon again on ICMBA webinars. God bless.